of that, then I introduce him formally, that way we can initiate um, this session. And again, in terms of how it works out, if you have any questions, please raise them in the Q&A and we'll address all the questions towards the end. We'll have two presentations. So Bushe will present um, and then Preeti will present. And then at the end, um, that's when we'll have um, both of them a joint presentation and then we can have the Q&A session. So to get started, I'll introduce um, Bushe. Then once Bushe has done presenting, I'll introduce Preeti. Then from there, then the session will run till the end. Okay, so a quick bio on Bushe. So Mr. Bushe Tagalashe holds a PhD degree in chemical engineering from the University of Pretoria and an, AMS, and, and an MSc engineering in materials technology with a specialization in silicon and ferroalloy production from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. He is a member of the Technical Committee of the Southern African Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, the SIMM, Johannesburg branch. He has over 15 years of research and development experience in the field of pyrometallurgy from the following global institutions, um, which is Mintec and Tronox Namakwa Sense, both in South Africa, the NTNU, Sintef in Norway, RTWH Aachen um, University in Germany, um, KU Leuven in Belgium, and NT. UA increase. He, is, he has been involved in metallurgical projects covering a range of commodities, including but not limited to silicon for solar industry, ilmenite and vanadium bearing um, titanomagnetite smelting, ferromanganese production and smelting of secondary resources for the recovery of rare earth um, elements, and conditioning of mineral um, byproducts. He has industrial experience through a stint of um, a stint at Tronox, Namakwasen's DC arc furnace operation for the production of high titanium um, TiO2 slags and um, peak iron. Furthermore, he has experience in hydrometallurgical processing through acid mine drainage collaborative projects with Vets University and collaborative research undertaking with researchers from leading European universities on the utilization of conditioned slags for recovery of valuable elements. His publications to date, for which he has been either author or author, include 20 conference and journal papers, some of which have been presented international, um, at international conferences in Africa and Europe. He is currently a chief engineer at, um, in the parameter division at MITEC, and I'll then give this opportunity for him to share his presentation. Over to you, Bishia. Okay, many thanks, uh, Mr. Kondwani. And I'll be sharing my presentation in just a minute, just a moment. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes, we can see it. And this one presentation mode, correct? Yes, you're good to go. Okay, perfect. Uh, so uh, thanks for that warm introduction, uh, Kondwani. So uh, basically this presentation is about my journey, honestly, uh, from when I left high school up until now. And I mean, I've studied locally, I've studied internationally as I've been introduced, and I thought maybe it would be a good opportunity for me to share and to really share uh, the theme. The theme for me has always been I've had this global outlook, but I've al always also wanted to be relevant or to be of service to home to South Africa. So my presentation will revolve around that. And of course, I've also used Amintech on my presentation. I mean, uh, as part of my journey, Amintech has played a big role in getting me to where I am today. So it's also then I'm also giving credit to them by using their, uh, their presentation template. So let's go for it. Uh, so starting abroad, I mean, it, uh, what happens, you become a soft, a sort of uh, commodity, as I've said, you get, you gain global exposure, you get exposure to different cultures, uh, you learn new languages, uh, you get an opportunity to overcome challenges associated to living abroad. Uh, your communication skills, believe it or not, they become polished because you get challenged abroad. You, become a better negotiator, uh, you, can, you can have a golden opportunity to be exposed to 
cutting edge research, given that you go to some of the top institutions around the world. So this is all beautiful. It looks nice. And of course, I mean, I didn't put in the, the cons. I've only put the pros here. If you have resistance to these uh, cons, you definitely face challenges. If you don't want to learn new languages, you are not, are you shocked with different cultures and you don't adjust, then you'll have big challenges with studying abroad. But I've looked on the positive. Uh, but what does this mean for a developing country like ours? It can really be a case of a blessing. If you go study abroad and then you come back, yes, wonderful, it's a blessing. But in an event that you decide to stay abroad, it could be a case for, for a country like us, a developing country, because then we lose you, then it becomes a, a, a brain drain. But what I then thought is, you could balance the two. You could really have your cake and eat it. You can be a sort of a commodity at the same time, be a blessing to your developing country. So my next slide shows just that. Uh, Dr. Henrik Johannes van der Peel, I really look up to him. He's one of the of the giants I've looked uh, up, up to this point and going forward. He was born in Pretoria in 1887, and then he studied in South Africa. He went to a Stellenbosch University, then it was called uh, Victoria College, and he achieved then his bachelor's in physics. Uh, then in 1908, he went to Leipzig University in Germany, one of the very top universities in Germany, and in 1912, he graduated with a PhD in physics. Subsequently, he went to the US. I mean, he was working with some of the top uh, research teams in the whole world. He was working with Nobel Prize winning scientists. So he went to the US, uh, worked uh, with them as an electrical engineer, but more so as a researcher. But by 1920, he was uh, invited back to South Africa by, uh, uh, by Jan Smuts, who was also a superstar. Jan Smuts, he himself went to Cambridge University, and at the time, then he was the prime minister of South Africa. So, uh, fun, uh, Van der Beel was then appointed as a scientific and industrial advisor of the Department of Mines and Industries. And under his leadership, ESCOM was uh, established in 1922, what we know today as ESCOM. And in 1925, ESCOM was established again under his leadership, what we know today as Acelo And in 1937, it was AMCO, which today we know as Metalloys. And uh, he sadly passed away in 1948, as you can see, he has done, he did extremely, extremely well for South Africa. He's rated as one of the greatest South Africans to have ever lived, and his work speaks for itself. So you can see, you can uh, go abroad, have this uh, international outlook, and at the same time be a blessing to your country, come back and have local uh, relevance. So uh, Dr. Hendrik Johannes van der Peel showcased that quite nicely. And of course, he was also a fellow of the a, of, of this uh, Royal Society in the UK, which uh, houses some of the very finest brains of all times, starting from the times of Newton in the 1600s, going all the way to, to the Faraday days, to the Albert Einsteins, and more recently to the uh, late Stephen Hawking. So he's part of that uh, family. So now we go to my profile. So we go now to back to back to earth. So I undertook my bachelor's of studies as uh, Kondwani has mentioned locally, the University of Pretoria, and then I went to NTNU uh, subsequently. And I've been, I mean, I've been at, at Mintech from 2005 until now. But in between, I've been to many parts uh, of, of mainly in Europe, but a bit elsewhere as well. So I've worked as a research assistant at Sintef in Norway, briefly, at Kaulouven in Belgium, at RWTH, I can extensively for four years, and also at, at TUA, uh, very briefly. And I'm current, I also then did a bit of stint in industry where I worked as a senior metallurgist at Tronox Namakwasens, but that was quite short lived. So I thought I will take you through my journey, which I call then a journey of a thousand steps to exactly where I came from. So originally I'm from a small a town, not really very small, from East London, but it's, I, I tell them in Europe, it's East London, not East London in UK, it's East London in South Africa. So I'm from uh, East London, and then I studied in Pretoria, as I've said, and then worked in Johannesburg, but I said, I mean, now I'm, I'm exposed to the local community. I would really like to get exposure to the international community and I had a golden opportunity in 2009 to undertake my MSc at, the, at NTNU. And again, that was uh, supported and seconded by Mintech. And that was to then establish relations between Norway and South Africa due to common areas of, of interest, which were silicon, the ferro alloys, which then are quite uh, extensive in Norway and also in South Africa. 
During my time in Norway, I had a chance to travel to China with the research uh, team from Norway, again to try to establish the research uh, relations with Chinese universities and industry. So I gained more exposure when I was in Norway, and it was at this point where I said to myself, my goodness, then the world maybe can be my oyster, I can go anywhere in the world. And then uh, subsequently, I came back, of course, to South Africa first, not directly to Germany. Then I went to Germany for uh, as a researcher towards PhD, uh, and I spent four years in Germany. And subsequent uh, to that, uh, or more, or during that time, I also visited uh, Belgium. I also visited uh, Greece. I spent two months as a research assistant at the NTUA in Athens. And very recently, this year, just before lockdown, I traveled to Canada with a team from Intech, and I had an opportunity with the team to travel to the University of Toronto. And of course, I mean in the whole mix, I've spent a lot of time at different uh, universities and ex I've been exposed to different research institutes around uh, Europe. So I hope that I can move this uh, oval uh, shape here, move it closer to Africa. It will be very nice that I could replicate that uh, back at home in, in Africa. But I'm back, so that is quite encouraging. So I'll say a few things about the countries I've traveled to. So in Norway, it's a relatively small country in terms of population. Only 5.3 million are individuals, but it is one of the highest per capita income in the world. You can actually see it, you can feel it when, when you're in Norway that these people are very wealthy, but of course they don't show it. Uh, they have some of the highest, uh, maybe the highest in the whole world, human uh, development index. And they also have one of the very lowest crime rates and inequality in the world. Uh, there are eight universities, uh, those are traditional universities, and nine specialized universities, and there are 24 university colleges. And uh, going to the Norwegian University of Science and Technology, where I studied, it rose uh, date back to 1760. And then at the NTH, which is then the Norges Technical School, which in English will be Norwegian uh, Technic, uh, will be Norwegian Institute of Technology, was established in 1910. And uh, the university is in excess of 40,000 students, which makes it then the largest university in Norway. There are the nine faculties and 65 departments. And the NTNU, Sintef Link, is the largest of any technical university uh, industry partnership in the whole world. And uh, NTNU is, of course, number one in the whole of Norway for engineering. So that's a bit of flavor about Norway. And going to Germany, there the population is about 83 million people. It's about half the size of South Africa. It is the fourth highest uh, GDP in the world, and it's number one in Europe. Uh, it is it is the third largest globe. It is the third largest global importer and exporter of goods, and that is attributed to the fact that Germany is a leader in some of the of the technologies uh, globally, and it's among the top tourism destinations in the world, believe it or not, because it has lots of heritage sites and maybe the most popular, the most famous of them all is the Cologne a Cathedral in Cologne. It's number four in the world in terms of the highest number of, of top-ranked universities in the country after US, China and the UK. Going to RWTH at University now, uh, the university was founded in October 1870. As you know, Germans are very precise. Even the month, it was actually the 10th of October 1870. It uh, the university has in excess of 45,000 students, and it is the largest technical university in Germany as a whole. There are nine faculties, 260 institutes, and there are 547 professors. Of course, this number of professors is a bit, little bit low because an institute in Germany will usually have two or three professors on average, but they will have associate professors, but they don't call them associate professors. So this is why this number is not maybe in excess of a thousand, but only 547. Um, RWTH Athens is number one university in the whole of Germany in terms of raising funds with industry. And of course, Germany is the top country in the whole world in terms of uh, sourcing funds from industry for support of their research. So that's quite encouraging. Uh, and uh, RWTH Aachen Uni is of course also number one in mechanical engineering, which is maybe the most prestigious engineering uh, a school in the, whole of, in the whole of Germany. You know, they have BMW, Mercedes, Benz, Porsche, and all these other fancy cars. So it's also number one in metallic and possibly or arguably also number one in engineering overall in Germany. And one of, it's also one of the most prestigious engineering schools in Europe and the world. Uh, then I'll go to Belgium. Uh, the population there is relatively small. So about 11.5 million people. It's one of the founding countries of the EU. So consequently, the 
the head of the EU is headed in Brussels. Uh, the country also has one of the highest uh, human development index in the world, and it's ranked as one of the safest, just like Norway. It also has some of the highest living uh, standards and also some of the very highest education standards in the whole world. Akeyo Lufen made his testament to that. It was founded in, uh, so that is Catholic University Lufen. It was founded in 1425. It approximately has 58,000 students, 15 uh, faculties clustered into two groups, and those are uh, the the science uh, and technology, the humanities, as well as uh, the, the biomedics. Uh, so it's, uh, it ranks as Europe's most innovative university. It also beats Cambridge. It's the most innovative university out of the US. And it's number one in Belgium for engineering and always ranks in the top two in, in Germany. Oh, sorry, in Belgium. Uh, so we're done with that now. So just a bit of a reflection on my side, uh, China to Canada. So that's my time uh, starting abroad between 2010 and my time back now in South Africa, 2020. So you can see with the first top left a picture in, uh, in China, this was during my MSc time in Norway. We traveled with the PhD students and the professors. We went to China to try to establish relations or exchange ideas with the Chinese and in much later than when I was in Germany, you can see we have a South African professor and we have a team of uh, PhD students from Germany, again, trying to establish South Africa-German relations. And much uh, recently, this was 2019 in Athens, again, you have uh, uh, professors from uh, Greece, we have a professor from South Africa presenting about uh, VET University and we have PhD students from uh, Greece. And of course, they am as a South Africa a Germany a student, uh, and more recently, when I returned to Mintech, just before lockdown, we traveled to Canada with the team. And you can see we have uh, the team from Mintech, or South Africa rather, and also we have a team from uh, the University of Toronto, again, looking at possibilities between Canada and South Africa, maybe trying a chance then for the next batch of students to also gain international exposure. So my very last slide does show then that this global outlook and local relevance is really something that is alive. As you can see at the bottom now, we had webinars recently between uh, Chris and South Africa through the SAIM, and similarly between Luven, one of the uh, Talks that was in Luven, now a senior researcher in Italy, one of the leading institutes there. And more recently, we have, oh, at the moment, we have this conference that is on the running uh, on acid mine drainage, again, a partnership between uh, RWTH, Aachen University, Vets University, Mintech is also there. So you can see we took a, pro a local problem, which is acid mine drainage, and we said to the world, please let's solve this problem together. It all started over there when we visited then South Africa in 2017, and subsequent to that visit, then there was another visit in 2018 where the team from Aachen visited at the University of Cape Town, and again, they have secured now uh, some funding between uh, University of Cape Town and RWTH, Aachen University. Again, this is saying we are solving our local problems, again, using resources that are global. And on that note, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. And that ends my uh, presentation. Thank you very much, um, Bute, for your presentation. So now I'll introduce um, short bio from ETTEM, and then shortly I'll then allow her to go ahead and then present. So Pritem is an internationally experienced chemical and environmental engineer with a strong committed, um, with a strong committed sustainable um, engineering projects, connecting both scientific and engineering discipline. She's from Ma Malaysia and they're a biracial child. So she's Chinese, half Chinese, and then half um, Sri Lankan. And her family background um, is quite a modest one, where she's from a um, working class of folks with um, most of the generation being actually first step from university, um, going into, she's actually the one, the first person to go to university, let me put it that way. And when she, she left um, as a student to Australia in 2011 to pursue her engineering degree, which was in chemical and environmental engineering, um, Luckily, her uncle actually sponsored those, those studies. And after successfully doing her master's engineering, she then joined um, um, EU, EU's Red Mud project as a PhD candidate in Athens, Greece. Um, and this was in the recovery of aluminium from bauxite, which is um, Red Mud. 
And it was in this specific project actually that then um, her and Bushe worked together as peers, as well as research partners. And they collaborated together in Germany with several of their research, which was uh, again further presented internationally at different conferences. And while um, the, the thesis is actually still in the works, she has returned to Australia and now has joined um, RGS Environmental, which is a team of geochemistry consultants in the mining and environmental services in Brisbane. So I would now actually like to hand over to Preeti that she can take us through her presentation. And as I mentioned, after that, then they'll have a joint presentation with Bootle. Thank you. Hi there. Hi, how are you going today? Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, one second. Hi, my name is Preeti, and um, as um, Kanwani has mentioned, and as well uh, as uh, that I've worked with Bookler uh, from the Vietnam project, uh, but I'll talk a little about my, uh, my journey from Malaysia all the way to Australia and to the Europe uh, region in general. Uh, so these are the places I've been. Um, and I will start kind of like uh, talking about like uh, how I started in the first place. So I was born in Malaysia and um, when um, I was there for like 21 years. So uh, that's not, uh, Malaysia has been uh, basically whom I grew up with. My mom and dad are actually uh, immigrants. Uh, my mom was born in Malaysia, but uh, she came from a family of immigrants. They all came there in the 19th. Uh, you know, 40s when the boom of mining happened and when the boom of agriculture happened in the first place. So that's how they met there. And um, I think um, uh, uh, that bit of like, uh, when I was young, I really loved physics and I loved literature. So that's just something about me when I started out. Um, and then I uh, had the opportunity to actually um, start uh, by chemical engineering. Um, now, uh, my uncle and aunt were the ones, as I mentioned, uh, stepped in to help to sponsor uh, me and my sister like, to head on to go um, for um, uh, studies abroad. Um, one of the reasons was because they knew how um, valuable it would be to actually go abroad, learn from a different perspective, and um, just um, bring that kind of like knowledge uh, in the field uh, or expand it, uh, expand it, especially when you're exposed to different education systems. In fact, a whole new world, essentially. And um, so thanks to um, Uncle and my aunt who really stepped in uh, to help us out. Um, we've got the chance to actually uh, experience that uh, in our life. So my first um, uh, beginning came from um, something called an international degree past week. I was with UCSI in Malaysia, and I did my first year there in chemical engineering, and then it was a one plus three program three years later uh, uh, with these kind of family with you. Um, and in 2011, I moved to Brisbane, Australia, and uh, started my chemical engineering there, continuing my second year uh, onwards. And I think around the end of my second year, I decided um, that uh, I wanted to actually minor um, and uh, focus more towards environmental engineering. So I had like the chemical and environmental background from that. Um, and I, at that time, one of the uh, things that I really wanted for myself was the fact that like, you know, um, sustainable practices and in a bit like uh, idealistic saving the world kind. But at the end of the day, um, it's something that um, at that time, um, I was really curious and I felt passionate about and something that I've always been uh, interested in my life. Um, and that kind of extended out to uh, 2014 Masters. Um, um, so um, they introduced a new program called Masters of Engineering in UQ. Um, I did that um, and that uh, converted into a dual major to the Masters of Chemical and Environmental Engineering. Um, I think alongside during that time as well, um, I um, had uh, experiences in several research projects uh, within the UQ hydrometallurgy team. Um, I got to work with um, mercury characterization um, with a fellow researcher who, if I'm not mistaken, she's also in the University of Pretoria area. Uh, now she's in Dubai, but she was working in the University of Pretoria for about a few years ago. Um, her name was Neetu Bansal. 
So she was my supervisor at, um, back in UQ as PhD student. Um, I worked with her in characterizing mercury in the data process. And um, then uh, I think from that point on as well, I had like a master's research placement. I worked with um, um, biogenic uh, um, characterization production of hydrogen sulfide using waste uh, water and uh, um, sludges and everything like that. So using a waste uh, section that uh, pr production of hydrogen sulfide gas from there, and then combining it with uh, say mining acid mine drainage or something like that, we may be able to precipitate out uh, some valuable methods of it. So I was one of the leading uh, primary uh, researchers, but it was a research placement of six months that I did there as well. So that was like my exposure to research, and I was actually really curious about it. And I think one thing that really inspired me was the fact that my uncle, um, he was also like an entrepreneur, but a scientist at heart, and um, always reminded me, you know, you have to have your foundations, you have to have your basics. And maybe, in a way, research was the, the basic. So at the end of the day, when I step into the engineering field, I want to know what exactly I'm working on, whether it's minerals, whether it's processing. Um, I want to know the science behind it so that I'm much more confident when I'm actually talking about it. And um, that led me to um, kind of like dabbling to uh, thinking, okay, I might want to do a PhD uh, if I get the opportunity. And this luck strikes, um, I got uh, um, this um, potential for an interview with the EU, Mary Curie Fellowship, uh, early training, uh, early research and training network thing. And this was in 2014, December, when I got the news. And I was really ecstatic. But it was a very competitive program. There was like about 150 or so participants. And um, I think out of like um, 150 people, they whittled it down to 22 people. And we had to do a presentation. Uh, in, um, and I did it uh, online uh, via a video um, to basically um, kind of like a showcase what uh, we could bring into this research are we the right fit? And if it was, um, then what uh, would we uh, go on from there? So um, out of that 22 people, it was trickled down to the like 13, I think two, uh, two more positions that were still uh, like uh, searching at that time. Uh, Bule stepped in definitely uh, somewhere uh, in the halfway as well uh, point, but he did such a wonderful job, you know, being part of the team and everything like that. And um, that's how we got to actually know in something called the Red Mark Project. Um, I moved to Athens, Greece in 2015 May, and I had my second one in Aachen, uh, and I met Jose there as well. Um, we did, like, um, I think 2017 and 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I'm sorry if I forget the uh, years, but uh, I returned to Brisbane in 2018 August. Um, I was a casual research assistant there in YouTube while um, the thesis was still in the book. And as on January this year, I started out as a geochemist with RGS Environmental. So yeah, that's the big problem. So um, I guess let's talk about the places that I've been and uh, what the experience is and maybe just a bit of like um, what Bulis actually mentioned as well. How, how are things actually there in the first place? And I know, especially in this time of pandemic, maybe talking about our journey is a lot when it doesn't seem likely, but hopefully when the vaccine is out as well, or in the fact that like things are actually moving online now, you'll realize that like having a global network is probably the most uh, important thing that you um, start building, especially when you're the early career uh, professional. And one of the things is, uh, that I figured out as well through my experiences here uh, was that like meeting people and so many international folks and perspectives actually gives the uh, idea of like um, exchanging ideas and uh, making sure that um, you kind of communicate each other, collaborate. And um, in, a, in a way, that's how we also, you know, uh, when you think about it, uh, bring together a vaccine in the first place. Research is all about collaboration, about figuring out it's about solving things. Uh, engineering is about solving things. In fact, that's what we as a collective uh, human time are trying to do. So uh, as much as you can, um, in any way possible, whether it's online or if you're able to actually go abroad to bridge that gap and to open that network. And I found that really useful. Anyway, um, in Malaysia, my formative years in going abroad, so I'll just probably talk a bit more about this. So, um, Malaysia uh, is formerly known as uh, Malaya. Um, used to be colonized by the Dutch, Portuguese, and British before gaining independence in 1957. 
uh, predominantly, like I mentioned, um, the mining and agriculture bases in the 1970s. Um, now it's currently an open state industrial market economy. So we tend to have a lot of like middle, uh, um, middle chain processing type. Um, if you were to build a car, they would be the ones to make the really parts inside the cars. I came up, I grew up in an industrial town, Shah Alam, that had a lot of these uh, um, um, yeah, companies. And such as Sumitomo, that's one big one as well. Um, and now um, it's also full of natural resources, a lot of petroleum, and tourism as major market. So if you're associating chemical engineering in Malaysia, often they would think petroleum. Um, but uh, now I think they're expanding as well the point of view of uh, processing engineering and beyond that. So um, Malaysia is part of an ASEAN nation, which is uh, also a Southeast Asia Re uh, Nation Region Association. And uh, it used to be known as ASA, uh, Association of Southeast Asia, which is like a group consisting of Thailand, um, Philippines, and uh, Federation of Malaya. Um, Malaya used, uh, Singapore used to be part of Malaya before uh, it also gained independence in 1961. Um, we are the third highest GDP uh, within the ASEAN region, uh, right after Singapore and Brunei. And we ha uh, have actually a lot of influx of migrants from uh, several parts of um, uh, Asia and Oceania. We've um, got um, uh, people all over the regions uh, around that uh, area that are mobilized and then uh, take to Malaysia as well as uh, part of the uh, country um, center like economy. And our population is about um, 31.5 million uh, as of 2018. We have about 1.8 million um, in 2000, like that's about like um, a fraction of it, I would say, right, in Kuala Lumpur, which is capital city. Our total area, because this part here is actually just the peninsula, we also have the Borneo section. That one here there is uh, about like, uh, uh, altogether, it's about 330,000 uh, square uh, kilometers. Now, the universities in Malaysia generally categorized as public or private universities. So you've got the public one, such as University of Malaya, the public research university, one of the oldest and highest ranking uh, um, simulation institution. And um, they have graduated like three prime ministers of Malaysia and several other very well renowned people. Um, but we also happen to have public universities, uh, such as uh, uh, locally established universities that are attached to, um, say, um, big university you see University of Queensland or even Monash University or campuses of foreign universities as well, which is Monash Curtin Taylor. Um, as UCSI, I am part of the private university sector, sector. So that one uh, was the um, uh, private university that allowed us to go to the IDP program um, so that we could uh, start the, uh, to study abroad. Now in Australia, as that my university days, learning and growing there, um, I lived in Queensland for about, I mean, um, for the last uh, uh, four years of uh, my studies there. And it is the third largest economy among the Australian states. So it's trends life is um, mining, agriculture, transportation, international education, insurance, and banking. So the mining sector tends to be on the upper region, uh, somewhere called Jackson. So this has massive processing plants that is cement or Rio Tinto, um, we have got uh, QAL, DHT, a massive um, uh, red mud, uh, sorry, um, bauxite uh, processing facility is actually up there in the first place. And um, then you've got the agriculture zone, which is up and north in Townsville as well. Banana is grown there. Uh, and I think uh, one of the things is like the First Nation peoples, uh, uh, Aboriginal, Australian, and Torres uh, Strait Islanders. Um, the Dutch colony arrived in 1606, Britain was in 1770. Um, it used to be part of New South Wales, but it separated in 1959, as a 1859. So the population is um, 5 million, but the Australia is like 24 million. So um, not too off from Malaysia, but very, very dispersed. Now you can even see here the total area is uh, 1.7 uh, um, thousand of, uh, square kilometers. Now this one is just Queensland. It's shows how massive Kingston is actually, that area is like all the localized. So I've been to these regions as well. And um, international education is actually a very, very important industry here. In fact, it took a really big hit uh, due to COVID uh, situation as the borders were all closed um, and a lot of it has moved online. Um, 
but I think one of the things that like I could say here is that um, there's actually a huge dive for our Asian or African um, students all coming here, you know, to try to get um, um, kind of like that understanding of like what it means to actually study here. Even the education system also, I would say, it's very different. Um, like an engineering um, degree uh, in Malaysia would be more growth learning, more theoretical, um, maybe a bit of practical uh, assessment. But uh, I would uh, say compared to my years uh, in, in uh, Malaysia, when I went to Australia, it was very, very practical, very uh, project oriented. So every sem semester that we had, we always had projects where we had divided into groups of four or five and we'd have to uh, prepare a report and present that. And there was a need for communicating and to be in a team and uh, to behave like how you would in a workplace, especially in an engineering environment. And um, I think, I feel like uh, UQ has done a very good job in trying to incorporate that um, and try to kind of push you uh, for us to be a lot more ready for the working world. And um, University of Queensland also here, uh, it's a state oldest university established in 1909, uh, frequently ranked among the world's top 50. So um, my experience as a chemical engineering graduate was actually uh, quite fantastic. It was quite grueling at times. I would say my design project uh, was one of the toughest times that I uh, had uh, that uh, one point in time in my life as well. But um, it was very um, uh, personality building. And I would say that like um, because of that, I developed kind of this really love and appreciation for teamwork and uh, being part of um, bringing coming together and resolving something. Like uh, whether it's some problem, one big prob uh, uh, problem that we could actually do together. And this led to the European Union's uh, Marie Curie, uh, uh, Marie Curie Action uh, Fellowship. So um, I would say I also discovered this uh, thanks by chance by my um, um, uh, supervisor from UCU and my uh, assistant professor, Professor uh, James Bond. So he actually had a person who sent me uh, uh, information about the Smart project. And at the time, I sort of expressed my interest in doing a PhD. He mentioned, oh, there was this uh, application, would you like to submit? And uh, I did. And uh, it turns out uh, what I had the experience uh, working with me too as well was uh, very relevant to what a red mark is. I was already familiar with the various process. You know? I was familiar with how aluminum was produced and um, I could actually just kind of jump in and focus on that. So um, then I left to Greece. Greece, also known as Hellenic Republic, cradle of Western civilization, you know, the birthplace of you know, Western philosophy, mathematical principles, Olympic games even. That's a lot, a lot of things that Greece is uh, very famous for. Um, its economy right now mainly comprise, uh, comprises of uh, service sectors. Industry is quite huge. There's, um, I was fed with the aluminum of Greece uh, during the uh, duration of my PhD. Um, agriculture as well is about 3% of the national economic output. So it's got a really good cheese, tomatoes, food, and everything. They are, uh, they are the founding member of the OECD, a uh, little known fact here. And BSD joined the European Union in 2000. So it was actually quite recent when you think about it. And the population here is about 10 million. Um, and as you can see here, the uh, amount of people in Athens is way, way uh, uh, smaller than uh, you know, Brisbane or uh, Malaysia combined. So um, it gives you kind of a sense of win. And that's one of the reasons because millions of Greek and this kind of like ties to what the brain thing is happening as well for um, um, sometimes, especially when um, in a global setting, you, you want to go and explore the world, but sometimes uh, as a developing nation or even a developed nation that is Greece, but is struggling due to the financial crisis, a lot of them feel uh, the struggle and uh, um, they want to aim for a better life at one point. And that's when, you know, our migration happens and occurs, whether it is US, UK, Australia, Canada or Germany. So that creates a large Greek guys for and they can still feel at home Say if you go to Melbourne, there's a huge Greek community there and everything like that. So I think it's it's like the brain drain is, is definitely a talking point uh, when it comes to kind of this kind of conversation that we're having today. Um, if uh, whether it's good or like I said, we do not know if it's truly a curse or blessing. Perhaps it is a curse, but within itself, but it also kind of opens up the network of um, uh, fellow Greeks to actually help and assist. And when the financial grief hits. So many people uh, from all over the world of Greek ancestry 
kapod in their kapod, you know, trying to help to uh, uh, grief so that they could actually be able to cope through the um, debt uh, um, measurements and everything like that. So, yes, um, a National Technical University of Athens is the university there that I was as well, uh, did my uh, PhD and had with there. So, it's one of the oldest, um, most prestigious engineering universities there. And it was uh, founded in 1837. Uh, it was a part time vocational school before named Raval School of Arts, although it's not really art, it's very vocational, I would say. So, yes. Um, now, I'm probably going to very touch lightly on this because. Uh, the next presentation will actually have more about that. Um, so this then delves into a whole bit much further business as well. Um, as I mentioned, because of the um, background that I've had um, in Australia that I've built up together with the um, UQ Hydro Mathematics team, um, we've managed to actually uh, um, pass that on uh, into uh, building this kind of project in the long run. So box of residue, known as red mud, contains several critical metals and is associated with like substantial management cost because of the amount that is produced because that much is the result of aluminium production of the gold and aluminium has been increasing in demand. Uh, one of the spills due to uh, dam uh, fault has uh, caused uh, a disaster in Ashka in Hungary in 2010 and this actually was the con uh, led to the construction of the Redmark project by um, the KU Leuven team uh, primary, who uh, then together wrote uh, a really good uh, uh, grant uh, draft for the Medic Theory Fellowship. And uh, when they pitched and won for it, and that's when Red Market X started and arrived. So it was, it was like kind of a, big, um, a baby of um, Kern, Janis, like a, a few people that I will probably introduce uh, in the next slide. And uh, Red Market trained 15 to be successful. And um, basically, we've got the public uh, contributions in, in a bit for this one. So as you can see, these are all the people in our group. We've got uh, we've had the opportunity every six months to meet together. And when we come together, we try to say, okay, what's the next step? What's the next milestone that you should be reaching? Because at the end of the day, we'll, we'll, our, um, as I would say from here, we are actually trying to tackle the barriers. We're trying to develop a fully close environmental uh, friendly recovery issues here. So this one here um, is how we got together every six months. We came in, we had a group meeting, and we just basically continued talking about like a, like a developing this process. And it was very iterative. It was unlike any other PhDs. It was not alone. Uh, what I worked and what Postland worked, our residues went to another researcher, and we continued to do that again and again. So yes, um, thank you so much again. Um, yeah, I just want to say, yeah, in, in loving memory of my uncle, it has been, uh, not for him and his patients, um, I wouldn't have actually had the opportunity to be out here. Okay. Any, any questions maybe from your side? So waiting for the guys to ask, ask their questions. Maybe it's a good time now for questions and for possible discussions, yeah. Well, definitely, I think. What I was curious though is was mentioned how well in your first presentation that that is you mentioned how you did your masters um, overseas and then while they got the chance to actually get exposure to China as well. Um, how often does one get opportunities to actually do masters overseas? Because I know with PhD it's readily easy to get that, but from a master's point of view. Uh, how easy is it, is it to actually execute it and get that in place as well? Okay, thanks. A good question, Kondwani. Uh, so again, uh, for the mass, as I said, again, this was made possible by uh, Mintech. They support, they seconded my MSc studies. So I'll say, again, it all boils down to resources. The very important thing here is you have to meet the two. You have to meet a ta talent must meet resources and then you can make these things happen. So uh, yes, you can be very, very talented, but at MSc level, it's not so easy to source funding to study abroad. For P at PhD level, yes, there are many opportunities. For example, for the project we applied for with Pretty, uh, the Horizon 2020 Red Mat project, this was open internationally. And they wanted uh, students from across the globe, not necessarily only from Europe. And they were actually encouraging that students come from other continents of the world as well. 
So at PhD level, yes, the opportunities are more, more pronounced than you have at MSc. Again, the big, uh, I think what is then inhibiting that to happen is the resources. It's similar with the Europeans as well. Uh, at PhD level, they travel a lot, but uh, at MSc level, not so much. They do travel, but mainly locally with the Erasmus, with programs such as Erasmus or other locally based programs, but not so much to say you go and study abroad uh, at MSc level. And again, it's those resources, because you must imagine that uh, um, investors, if you have a company that's going to put in uh, resources, they want a return on their investment. So a, a research at PhD level then is more meaningful. It has a, a very high chance that this research will be scaled up and then from scaling up it will be industrialized. And that's exactly what is happening with the RedMart project. At this stage, it's currently running at, uh, at tonnages scale. When we did the experiments with Priti and the team, we're only running at gram scale, hundreds of grams at most. But now we are running at, uh, now the team, team that is that they are running at tonnage scale and the next step will be to industrialize. So usually then at MSc level, you don't have then a team of MSc students working on such a level. So that is always then about that balance. Yeah. Um, oh, fantastic. Hello, um, yes, please. That, um, sorry, I'd like to add as well about the Marie Curie Fellowship Program. Um, so Europe actually has a bunch of programs such as Erasmus Program and also the Marie Curie Fellowship that kind of wants um, um, basically gather talent from all over the world. Uh, whether it's all of, uh, they kind of promote um, uh, global traveling here and there so that um, the more people come in, the more they gain brains as well and the uh, more ideas and perspective actually improve uh, the research. Um, if you remember the black hole um, last year, the, the one that went viral where they actually managed to make an image, it was one of a European partnership with several universities all across the globe actually. Um, so Europe's been the forefront at collaboration, and that's one thing that I noticed um, quite uh, heavily uh, at that level. Oh, fantastic. And actually, I had a question for, for you, um, Preeti, before I address some of the questions in the Q&A, just to find out what, what motivated you to study further to PhD. So initially, you went for your master's, and then you went for your PhD. But what is one thing that drove you um, to get to that point? I would say, um, a key, I, in a way, I would say definitely I was influenced um, by the way that my uncle um, has thought. So um, he never had the opportunity you know, uh, beyond uh, high school. So, but he loved science. So he went to libraries, you know, cycled and you know, um, basically learned all he can about gardening because he loved gardening and he loved fertilizers and stuff. But he branched into that field of business of agriculture and uh, uh, farming and fertilizers until um, much, much later in life, he managed to officially open up um, uh, a comp uh, like industry, fertilizer industry in Malaysia. And I think um, at the heart of it all, he started out with science. And ever since I was young, I was um, always uh, close to my uncle who was basically my uh, second father and he would always tell to me, you know, make sure that your basic is correct, make, make sure that your foundations are right, because if you don't have that, you don't know your product works, you don't know what you're talking about. And as an engineer, sometimes I feel like we only do the surface level, but we don't actually understand our product. And that's also a big reason why I wanted to do a PhD, because at the end of the day, I want to understand what I'm talking about at the end of the uh, And so that's the influence on me, uh, why I chose this to do as well. Yeah, awesome, yeah. fantastic. Um, okay, so, Few questions have popped in the Q&A. Um, the first one is for Bushe. So the question is, does RTWH Aachen University offer master's um, studies um, that include a year of coursework, as in the case of NTNU? So they're asking for a vet student that's currently in their honors year. Okay, uh, thanks uh, for the question. Uh, so let's go to RWTH. I can what they do then at MSc level. So also a correction with NTNU is not a year of coursework that they offer for international students. NTNU offers a one and a half year of coursework. So the project work is only six months. So you do one year, but then this other semester is really then half of uh, coursework and half of uh, pre, uh, is a mini, mini, mini thesis. 
Similarly, in Germany, they have exactly the same arrangement. You have coursework for about a year, and then the other semester is really then for a mini test. You have two mini tests, and then before you do your thesis. So the thesis is only six months, not a year. So a recommendation I would have for South African students. So there are two things. Yes, you can go and study there full time, or another possibility if you don't have funding, full funding, because it's quite expensive. As much as the universities don't charge fees, by the way, NTNU in Norway, and also universities in Germany, they don't charge fees. But of course, you have to pay. You only pay for admin. In Norway, when I did my MSc, I would pay per semester about 600 rands just for the admin. So I, when I was in Aachen, per semester, I would pay about uh, 3,000 rands. Again, that is for admin and also for the bus card. So we had a bus card that will allow us to travel. An equivalent here then would be to travel around Gauteng for the entire semester. So that's what you pay for, not the actual fees. So, but then generally the standard of living is high. So generally you need, let's say, 100,000 rands to live for a year. So that's quite costly for an MSc student. Yeah, so if you don't, if you're not in a fortunate position as I was, I will also recommend that you do your MSc here and then you go to a place like Aachen or a place like NTNU for the project work. For example, when I did my project, when I was doing my MSc, we had a top student from NTNU. He came to the University of Pretoria. He was supervised by Yolette and he spent exactly six months and that was strictly for his MSc thesis. So that can also be done then in the exchange that a student will go there for experiments and run the experiments in the state of the art facilities in Aachen or at NTNU and then come through and complete uh, the MSc thesis. And of course, I mean, there's lots of support when you're in Europe, I must say. So by the time, by the end of the six months, you, because then you don't wait, you don't wait for equipment, you don't wait for reactants, everything is there for you, the program is there for you, you literally get and you get running. So by the end of the six months, you'll also be able to write at least a journal paper, a conference paper, so you get lots of support and the results are there to show. So that will be my advice uh, to, to, the, to the student it is, is referring to. Awesome, thank you. Um, so the next question is from Isabel. I think I'll let both of you share your, your insights as well, because I think it, it will definitely be relevant to both of you. So the question is that maybe share with us what preparation you should, rec um, also share with us a preparation that you would recommend for anyone that's going to live abroad for their studies. So the one thing that you wished you had known before you left um, the shows. So pretty, I'll give this one to take first and then I'll... Oh, of course, this performance um, is very close to my heart <laughs> and a very thoughtful question as well. Yeah. Very thoughtful. Um, yes. I think the first thing, uh, one thing I wish I'd done is, um, I think both chances I would say, um, I just jumped feet, uh, feet first and like I didn't even really uh, think to uh, so much sometimes. Like I would say, in Australia, it's definitely a lot more easier because I spoke English and the lingua franca there is English. People understood me and everything. But when I went to Greece, um, um, the language barrier was such a big thing that the first week there, I literally got lotion instead of body wash because I didn't know what I was buying, you know, and I took back home and it's just the wrong thing. I think the first thing I'd like to say is um, leave your comfort zone out, you know, because you're going to you're going to get shocked. There's so much culture shock in every different country, um, silly time things, and um, expect the unexpected. It's just um, and just enjoy the ride in a way, you know. Like uh, um, sometimes uh, some days you're gonna get hurt up. I'm not gonna lie. Um, in those days, if you meet um, a friend, you know, Saturday or something like that, like to help you to get through, because it can be very lonely at times, depending on where you go, and just. Um, um, especially um, if it's your of a different descent and different race, um, it can, can get quite tough as well. And that's also maybe another level that you feel so you might want to consider places that are more accepting or more comfortable as well. So that some um, these are the things I think before leaving that you should consider when, before you leave a lot. But once you get there, enjoy the ride, find your people, and go for it. Okay, so many thanks, Pretty. Then from my side, I will say, so very thoughtful question again, Isabel. So what is very, very important when you go for international studies, you must know the reason why you are, you are, you are going there. Because then you are, you are going to, it's going to be challenging. I will not lie to you. It's going to be challenging. At some point, you'll ask yourself a reason, why am I even here? 
and it doesn't, I mean, it happened in Norway and it happened again in Germany. So it doesn't matter where you go, you must know the reason because you, you get challenges to that point and people then outside do not understand. Or even locals, they will also not understand this will be you. So you must know that's very important that you know the reason you are there. And then you go and fulfill that uh, that reason. Why? And of course, you must also be open-minded as Preet is saying, you, you have to overcome. I did mention at the beginning, there are all those pros, but you can say they can be cons. I mean, you can they can easily be cons. You can be uh, shocked by the culture of this new place. And of course, the people will not understand and they're not being mean. You must understand that. I mean, at the very end, they're, they're not mean, but it's you that we are shocked. So the problem is you, not them. So it's very important to have that purpose when you go abroad so that you say, this is the reason I'm here and yeah, and be open-minded. And also what's very important, again, I loved Isabel, you know what Isabel, like a question, I mean, it's all thought, I thought such a question would come up, and not that I prepared for it, but again, this is very close to my heart, because then I, I had uh, these questions myself. What is very important before you leave as well is, it's, uh, you must have uh, as, establish a support system where you are living locally and also maybe try to get that uh, when you get to, to the new place globally find that network of yours I'm talking now not only network academically I'm talking find your people that if you're having a hard day you must be able to talk to someone really that's what sometimes it takes it needs that person to talk to. So please, it's very important. You don't leave South Africa with that, or you don't leave another country without, and you go to a foreign country, you're going to be in trouble. So you definitely need to find uh, to find that. And again, yes, it's nice when you get to the new place that you, uh, so it's really support system. So you have a very strong support system locally where you are from. So, and also in the new place to find support system, but again, now don't be on the one extreme. Again, I don't like to talk badly about people, but if there's one thing the Chinese uh, miss, they usually stick together. You'll only just find Chinese. They all go for dinner together. So please don't just stay with South Africa. I didn't just live with South Africans. I lived with everyone from all over the world. So that's very important as well. Please embrace uh, uh, new people and also embrace the people you are, you are going to, to this new country as well. That's very important because the sooner you do that, the sooner they will also open up to you. So you must be very open. So sometimes you must ask yourself then that question. If you are seeing these challenges, maybe the problem is not uh, the other people. Maybe the issue is with you. You have to change. So I hope I've answered that well. Thanks. Oh, no, fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, I think it brings us to the end. Um, I'd like to actually give you both a chance maybe for some closing remarks. Start with you, Pretty, and then Bush. Okay. Uh, thank you so much again uh, for the time chapter here and Kandrani uh, Kabula. Thank you, so, uh, Gugu. Thank you so much for organizing this one. Uh, I really appreciate the chance that we talk about this. Uh, it's not something uh, we often get the chance to like come together and have this conversation. Um, I think that my last thoughts about the, uh, this these days as well is that. Um, especially in, in this time of the pandemic, you know, it may be tougher to try to imagine. So you probably just want to do start, you know, start working of like, kind of like building a base of our research of like what is available out there. And so at least by talking to us now, you realize that the EU or the expensive uh, master's program of PhDs and the different and I suppose type of others, Australia, whether it's like Canada, looking into these kind of um, regions, um, there's opportunities abound. Finding out what is right for you and going uh, and making that um, kind of like the priority in uh, the mm -hmm. next coming years. For, uh, and that's something uh, that, um, especially in this day and age, if you feel that you're ready to do it, I would definitely encourage you to do it. That's, yeah, that's it. I, I wish I did that. <laughs> so like, go ahead and uh, do that. Awesome. Appreciate it. Okay, uh, thanks, Pretty, and again, thanks to the team, thanks for the opportunity, thanks to the attendees. I mean, none of this would have been possible without you. But for me, the very important one, especially then with me and Pretty here, is uh, then again looking from the background and the perspective. Uh, in South Africa, I mean, we're not we're wealthy people. There's a very small fraction. We have very high inequality. And again, there's lots of talent and there are lots of opportunity locally and more so globally. So don't look at your circumstances and say, 
because I come from these humble beginnings, I cannot get, I cannot go to Australia. I mean, you can see with Pretty, she has shown that you can go to Australia, you can go to uh, to Europe and study there, with, irrespective of your, of, your, of your starting point in life. I have done exactly the same thing. So please don't look at, uh, for me, when you see a mountain, don't see that mountain and don't, uh, and say this is the end. You cannot climb, this is Mount Kilimanjaro. For me, when I say mountain, I want to climb and I want to go to the next, to move to the next one. So again, for me, that a global perspective is very important. And again, the local relevance. And again, please uh, look at the opportunities that are out there and not limit yourself. And don't look at your current uh, standing and say, no, I don't have the resources, I will not make it. You have people out there that are looking, you have people out there that have best wishes for you and go out there, for, go out there and knock and doors will be open for you. So thanks. Fantastic, well. thank you very much. Um, I think then we can go ahead and end the session. Thank you to our attendees. Thank you so and much. thank you to the SMM team for organizing this session for us. Have an awesome day.